A truly astonishing story, but one that actually happened. An event unique in the history of Australian aviation. It's a story of how one light aircraft caused three hours of panic in the suburbs of Sydney. It all began with a 30-year-old pilot named Anthony Thrower, who'd rented an Osterarcher aircraft from a flying school at Bankstown Airport. It was just before nine on the morning of August the 30th, 1955. Thrower had planned an hour of touch and goes to brush up on his landing technique. But after only one circuit of the aerodrome, the Oster's engine began to splutter and the pilot was forced to land. For Anthony Thrower, it seemed a lucky break. An engine problem had entered his solo flight close to the ground. He was safely back on terra firma, but was determined to be on his way as soon as possible. What happened next? would hold a city spellbound. There was no self-starter on the Oster, so Anthony Thrower had to restart the engine by hand, a bit like cranking an old T-model Ford. That was the easy part. The engine roared back to life. But apparently, the brakes failed. And to Thrower's amazement, the Oster headed off down the airfield. Next thing Thrower knew, his aircraft was airborne and there was no one at the controls. His first concern was that the Oster might crash and kill someone, a concern shared by staff in the control tower. As the Oster weaved overhead at low altitude, they issued an alert and evacuated all the airport buildings. Circling over suburban Bankstown, the plane was certainly a safety risk. But after 15 minutes, the crisis took a dramatic turn for the worse. The pilotless Oster Archer headed for the centre of the city of Sydney. Old Eric Bohm said to me so many years ago... My Radio brother... commentator John Pearce was at Station 2GB that morning. He'd been a top gun in the Air Force, and when the first reports came through, he thought the whole thing was a hoax. I was in the studio doing a morning program and Leon Becker, the station manager who had also been in the Air Force, raced in, gave me a piece of paper and said, read it, mate. And it was typed rather roughly and it said, an aircraft is flying over Sydney, there is nobody in it. And I showed him this thing and said, you know, it's not April the 1st. Pull the other one, mate. And he said, read it. And so I did. As the Oster headed over the suburbs of Sydney, Pierce was able to confirm the report, and he began a blow-by-blow -blow description. We were aware that there was reaction, because I think we probably fell for the trap of Dad's army by saying, people of Sydney, don't panic! And of course, everybody then ran into the street and panicked, which is the surest way to do it. Uh, we were aware of that, but not nearly as much as trying to keep ahead of the story and tell people where the aircraft was. And at that stage, we had people phoning us, although we couldn't put calls to air in those days, but people phoning us with observations. Now, they weren't always reliable. They were observing everything from four-engine Qantas aircraft down to the one concerned. But having some knowledge of Sydney and some knowledge of flying, I was able to plot pretty well where it was. It was, in fact, almost over the centre of the city. Down below, police patrol the streets Fire and ambulance brigades were on red alert. Even fire floats were standing by on Sydney Harbour. And still new information flooded in to Radio 2GB. I do remember one of them, which scared the pants off everybody, was a report that there may be, or may have been a child in the aircraft too. That theory was checked out by a Navy aircraft, which was tracking the Oster's dangerous progress. The verdict on the child was negative. The cockpit seemed to be empty. By now, it was 10 o'clock. The Oster was over the harbourside suburbs, and no one had the faintest idea when or where it might suddenly plunge back to Earth. That was when the Air Force got into the act. 
and the drama veered perilously close to farce. They sent one of their Wirraways to intercept the runaway. The Oster, meanwhile, was climbing in a tight orbit and was just off the coast. The RAAF Wirraway was armed with a handheld Bren gun, but when it came to fire, a new problem emerged. At 3,000 metres, it was so cold the gunner's hand had frozen to the gun. So the embarrassed Wirraway crew gave up the chase, and in came an RAAF meteor. Time was running out, and so was luck. Both cannons on the meteor jammed, and the Oster escaped unscathed again. And the Air Force then had to stand back and said, sorry, we can't do it. Which must have been delight to the people down at Nara, who three times already had phoned saying, chaps, let me know when you want me. And they finally called and said, oh boy, you better come up. The Navy boys from Nara who came to the RAAF's rescue that day were Bob Blewett and Peter McNay. On board their Sea Furies, they discovered their mission was to search and destroy. But Peter McNay recalls they weren't immediately told exactly who the enemy was. We knew there was something going. We knew it wasn't um, sort of a you know, war situation because we, we weren't armed with live ammunition. It was just normal ball ammunition which we used for, for, uh, for practice. So, you know, there was, there was something strange which we didn't know. By this stage, the pilotless Oster had been in the air more than two hours and was out over the water. A safer target, but by no means an easy one. The Sea Fury pilots now knew what their target was and began searching for the renegade plane. Flying out for a few minutes, all of a sudden I, I spotted a, uh, what I thought was the aircraft way out on the horizon. So I, I said to, to Bob in typical Pommy fashion at that stage, tally how arming, and uh, flew off. Then all of a sudden, uh, I heard this plaintive voice saying, please don't shoot, don't shoot. You know, this is a teal aircraft on its way to, to New Zealand. So I <laughs> right. After that near miss, the Sea Furies got a fix on the Oster. And before they went in for the kill, Peter McNay made one last reconnaissance run. He was just a little nervous about that earlier report of a child on board. Because even though I thought, uh, having looked in, there was nobody there, we still weren't quite sure, because it was terribly difficult when the Oster is doing, going fairly slowly in a tight right-hand turn, and you're doing at least 100 knots, trying to look in through the, the cockpit. So there was a little bit of nervousness there, hoping against hope that <laughs> there wasn't anybody in it. Remember, it was nearly three hours since Anthony Thrower watched in amazement as his unmanned Oster took off. Narrowly missing the control tower, the plane headed for Sydney. First, the RAAF failed to shoot down the intruder when the gunner's hand froze to the trigger. An Air Force meteor abandons its mission when its cannons jam. A passenger jet makes a hurried radio call when it's mistakenly targeted by the pursuers. But finally, the drama reached its climax. I came round again and gave it a, a short burst, which actually rocked the aircraft slightly and rocked it slightly out of the foot rate for a turn. And uh, Bobby Blewett came in and gave it another burst of about 12, 15 rounds, and it just caught fire and started to spiral down. And uh, it just was sort of went straight into the, into the sea and sank. Peter McNay and Bob Blewett saved the day, but it seemed nothing could save the RAAF's reputation. The Oster went down at 11.42 a.m., almost three hours after takeoff. But the ripples continued in the National Parliament long after the runaway sank into the sea. I remember Townley, the minister, he copped it left, right and centre from people who knew and people who didn't. And people who said, why are we spending all this amount of money on defence when we can't shoot down an Oster? It was a very, very good question. The Oster affair terrified Sydney siders. It seemed that only luck had prevented a major disaster. 
there was the question of national defense. If one unmanned and unarmed light aircraft could give the RAAF's finest a run for their money, what chance did Australia have against a real enemy? And there was one final blow to national pride and prestige. Australians couldn't even claim the two pilots who delivered the coup de grace as local heroes. Bob Blewett and Peter McNay were in fact Englishmen on loan to the Royal Australian Navy.